everyone uh, to Reflections on Bioinformatics Librarianship. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Kate Majewski, and with me is Bonnie Madak, a librarian and scientist with the National Center for Biotechnology Information, or NCBI, which is part of the National Library of Medicine. Hello, everyone. And we're going to introduce our special guest in just a moment. Today, we're talking about bioinformatics and libraries. Bioinformatics is the organization and analysis of biological and related information using computers. Uh, this webinar is a component of our National Library of Medicine course, Bioinformatics and Biology Essentials for Librarians. And we've also invited anyone interested to join us to learn more about bioinformatics librarianship. Um, as we go along today, if you have questions for our guests or any of us, uh, please enter them in the chat panel. I'm sorry we've, we've muted everyone but our speakers today, so um, just use the chat panel to communicate with us, please. Thank you. And we're going to address the audience questions at the end. Bonnie? Thank you, Kate. So as mentioned, today's webinar is part of the Online Bioinformatics and Biology Essentials for Librarians course, that's abbreviated BBEL, so if I slip and say BBEL or BBEL, you'll know what I'm talking about. The course participants have spent the last couple of weeks learning about genetics and biology. I'm delighted that we have others with us that are interested in bioinformatics librarianship, and I'll just give a brief orientation for you who are not taking the course. So Kate defined the bioinformatics term earlier as the organization and analysis of biological and related information using computers. You might consider bioinformatics as the data science of biology, where the data are a huge collection of gene or protein sequences and related information such as when or where a gene is expressed or whether different protein forms are made from the same gene. Researchers and clinicians identify the actual DNA or RNA sequence of a gene or an organism's genome and study that sequence, depending on their field of study, often by comparing the sequence to other organisms. The sequence data are deposited in three main databases that are around the world. GenBank at the NCBI is one of those three databases. Since its start in 1988, NCBI has led the field of bioinformatics as we have curated data, both genetic and protein sequence data, related structure, chemical, and more recently clinical data for researcher research that's going on around the world. NCBI continues to fulfill its mission to serve as the world's library for biological information and to facilitate new discoveries by making connections at all levels of biological organization to cure disease and improve health. NCBI staff, such as myself, carry out this mission, and we rely on people like yourselves to help us, and that depends on the scope of your duties or opportunities, because many of you help us educate students and researchers about the biological data and tools, and this helps to create and foster new connections among the people who work in bioinformatics. So today we have welcomed three colleagues who work in libraries to share their reflections on bioinformatics librarianship in alphabetical order, and I ask each of them to say hello after they are introduced. First, we have Jean-Paul, or J.P. Cornier, M.S., who is a bioinformatics Nationist at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, Health Sciences and Human Services Library. As an information resource specialist, JP covers many aspects of bio, biotechnology and bioinformatics, including research data management. 
Welcome, JP. Hi, Bonnie, and hello, everybody. Great. Thanks, JP. Kumru Castro, MS, MI, is a staff member at Drexel University in Philadelphia. She serves as the liaison librarian for several departments that include subject areas of biology, chemistry, earth and environmental science, and engineering. Kumru builds library collections and teaches information and research skills to faculty and students. Welcome, Kumru. Hello, Bonnie. How are you? I'm doing great. Glad you're with us today. Thank you. And our last, our last panelist today is Elliot Smith, MLIS, who is the Emerging Technologies and Bioinformatics Librarian at UC Berkeley, where he currently supports the students and faculty of the Departments of Molecular and Cell Biology and Integrative Biology. Welcome, Elliot. Hello, everyone. Great. Thank you. Let's start with asking each of you how you came to the field of bioinformatics librarianship. And JP, will you begin? Sure. Uh, so I have essentially been working in research my whole professional career. I started out in labs, uh, in a number of different areas of research. Uh, uh, orthopedic molecular biology, um, immunology, rheumatology. Uh, so I've essentially always been the hands-on guy in the lab, uh, ensuring that the that the experiments are conducted properly. And uh, I amassed uh, a, a large amount of background in in molecular techniques and lab techniques in general. And um, uh, <clears throat> so. I even spent some time selling uh, pipettes at the, at the NIH, of all places, and up and down the biotech corridor here in our area. Uh, so uh, with that background, uh, I, I leveraged that to pursue an opportunity that I saw in one of the job offerings at the university at the library. So I thought it, with my background and assisting researchers, I'd be able to uh, do a good job. Working, working in the library and helping more researchers than just a single person or a single PI. Okay. What do you find rewarding about your job? Uh, so working with librarians is uh, definitely rewarding and very engaging. Uh, also, when I came to work in the library, I had to build the bioinformation program from the ground up. So it really gave me an opportunity to dig deep and find out what do I know about bioinformatics, what I know about what researchers really need in terms of bioinformatics, uh, and I tied these, this information together to, to, you know, enhance my understanding of it and then also build a program which uh, I, I was able to bring to the university, and it's given me a lot of opportunities to connect uh, on campus and, and nationwide, too. Great. So we'll come back to you in, the, in a few moments. Kumru, can you share your background, please? Um, I have been involved in uh, the field of life sciences for more than 20 years. Uh, I started my career as a research scientist for biotechnology in uh, Turkey, Istanbul. Uh, it was National Institute of Technology. Uh, and, uh, and after I joined the pharmaceutical industry and worked uh, in regulatory affairs uh, departments with leading roles about 13 years. Then after we moved to USA uh, due to my husband's job and uh, then I started teaching in one of the closest community college. I started teaching uh, general biology. And uh, in 2017, I moved to Drexel University for my role here in uh, liaison librarianship. Okay. And can you share how attending a workshop at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory led to led you to move away from the scientific research in the pharmaceutical industry to working in the field of information management? 
Sure. Um, when I was a, uh, a young faculty for biology, I uh, saw that uh, Cold Spring Arbor is uh, recruiting some uh, faculty members for their uh, silencing genome uh, project. So, uh, silencing genome is uh, a new um, project uh, for me. I didn't know anything about that time, uh, and it is, I learned so much later on. Uh, it is a double-stranded RNA uh, or RNA interference, uh, the other name. So, RNA interference occurs in plants, animals, and um, humans. And it has an important role on regulation, gene expression regulation. Uh, SS defense uh, against viral infections also involves RNA interference. Uh, by attending workshops uh, such as this one, uh, it was not the only one, <laughs> uh, I realized that much of the lab bench work that I've done when I was a research scientist uh, are all curated and uploaded on NCBI databases. Uh, so it was a very interesting uh, discovery for me. And my interest in information management systems for life sciences grew from there. OK. And again, we'll come back to you in a few moments. But to get the last panelist's route to bioinformatics librarianship, Elliot, can you share us? your journey. Sure. Um, I have to say I'm somewhat envious of the extensive research backgrounds of JP and <laughs> Peru. Um, my route to bioinformatics librarianship was a little bit less direct. Uh, I, my science background is in physical chemistry rather than biology, although, of course, I took biology classes too. Uh, and then uh, after I got my Bachelor of Science, I taught science at college for several years. Um, but after that, I became a buyer for a really great used bookstore here in Berkeley called Bose. Um, and finally realized that librarianship was a field that would enable me to combine my enjoyment of teaching and public service with my love of learning and information discovery. It took me a while to reach that insight, though. <laughs> but you did reach it. Finally. Yeah. Finally. So when we were preparing for today's webinar, we asked the panelists questions to help them gather their thoughts. And Elliot shared a story about how being there when a colleague retires sometimes leads your path, your career, into a different direction. So Elliot, can you share that story with the audience? Yes, indeed. Um, I was initially hired here at Berkeley as the Emerging Technologies Librarian um, uh, for the Koshland Bioscience Library, and I did not have any uh, subject specialist or liaison responsibilities or selection responsibilities. Um, but then another librarian retired, and uh, they essentially came to me and told me that I was now the subject specialist and liaison for molecular and cell biology. And so I thought, you know, this was a role that I should embrace. And um, I um, took a look at the programs and services that existed here on campus and realized that there was no recurring program of bioinformatics support and training. And that seemed like an obvious gap to try to fill. So uh, that's when I... Um, uh, did my own bioinformatics training through NCBI and their extremely useful courses, and then developed my own workshops. Uh, and uh, after a while, they um, recognized these efforts by adding bioinformatics to my job title. And did people notice when bioinformatics was added to your job title? That's a really great, great question. Um, I, I'm not sure how much people have noticed it. Um, I am essentially doing, I uh, have been doing uh, for the past few years. Um, so I, uh, that's a really good question. I'm not sure how significant it is to others that I have bioinformatics in my job title, but I do know that on occasion I'll get um, 
um, uh, people asking for research consultations, uh, and they'll tell me, oh, I noticed that, you know, you're the bioinformatics librarian. So I, I think it has been helpful. Okay. That sounds great. I'm going to continue with Elliot and ask him about his most interesting experience that he's had as a librarian. But before he answers, this is a cue to Kate to open the first set of poll questions. Okay. So um, I have put up on your screen, it may appear on the right-hand side of your screen, a couple of poll questions um, just to find out as a group um, what kind of experience you have in supporting biology or biomedical programs and specifically whether you support bioinformatics. So um, everybody on the call in the, um, in the webinar, if you could just take a look and take a moment to fill out those poll questions and then press submit at the bottom when you're done and then we're going to take a look together to see who we are here. Okay. But while you're answering those questions, let's hear from Elliot about interviewing Jennifer Dudna, and I'll let you explain who she is, that that was an interesting experience. And did that arise because of the emerging technologies part of your job title? So that's another great question. Um, although I have a functional job title, uh, my position actually combines functional and subject librarian responsibilities. And the interview opportunity, I think, involved both. And uh, Jennifer, I think it's pronounced Doudna. Jennifer. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Is a faculty member in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology at Berkeley, which is the department I, one of the departments I support. Um, and um, she led the effort to develop the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology that probably everyone has heard about. Um, if you are interested in hearing more about that, she has a wonderful TED Talk um, that's gotten millions of views by now. Uh, and she wrote a book about her experiences called A Crack in Creation, which was published in 2017. And when it was published, my library held a public author event uh, to celebrate that book. And uh, she came and was interviewed by the head of the library, Sue Koskinen, and I also uh, participated in that interview and fielded questions from the audience. And it was fascinating to hear about her journey and the key insights that led to the CRISPR breakthrough. Um, and of course, this was a public event in Berkeley. Um, a lot of people raised questions about the ethical issues that the technology raises, and she dealt with those very forthrightly. Um, and so that was just a really wonderful experience. And having the opportunity to actually have conversations with researchers who are making these kinds of transformative discoveries like gene editing is an amazing part of being a bioinformatics librarian. That sounds very interesting. And I'm going to now go to Kumru. And you, too, have met some famous scientists. Tell us about the impact on you. Sure. Uh, when I was a, a bioinformatics intern at the University of Pennsylvania Biomedical Library, I attended a two-day uh, workshop. Uh, it is about a UCSC genome browser. And afterwards, uh, I joined a meeting uh, to discuss potential uh, projects with the researchers uh, and the library. So one of the uh, person that I attended uh, through this meetings, uh, his name is Benjamin Void. Uh, he is, uh, let me read his <laughs> full title because I'm, I don't want to make a mistake. He's an uh, assistant professor of systems pharmacology and translational therapeutics and uh, of genetics at the University of Pennsylvania Perelman School of Medicine. Uh, he received a presidential uh, early career award for scientists and engineers. Uh, I was in 
impressed with his enthusiasm and uh, in regards to enhancing a collaboration with the uh, library, but specifically biomedical library with us. And uh, we uh, discussed so many projects that uh, we can involve and uh, we can help uh, to his group. Uh, it was very interesting to me. Uh, the other uh, famous person uh, that I met uh, during this time period, um, about a week later, uh, I met Professor Banu Onaral uh, accidentally in a parking uh, garage uh, elevator. Uh, she established the first uh, biomedical engineering college uh, in the world. She influenced me, uh, my decision to join to uh, Drexel University. Oh, that sounds very interesting as well. Thank you. So thank you both for sharing that, those stories. And I'm going to turn it back to Kate to tell us about the first set of poll questions. So this is very interesting. And um, I'll just take a, a few more seconds to um, to close the poll, but um, so we ask you two questions. First, whether you support a biology or biomedical program, and secondly, if you support bioinformatics. And we have quite a few um, folks who who do both. So let me see. Um, hopefully, you can see up on your screen now the results of the poll. I know on my screen I had to expand a little bit to see it. You might need to do the same. Um, so, of the 57 folks who responded, uh, 41 support a biology or biomedical program at their institution, wow. and 34 support bioinformatics. So we have a healthy number of folks out there, mm -hmm. and I don't know if the rest of you feel the same way. I'm actually kind of surprised. Mm -hmm. um, because it was just a few years ago when we had a webinar like this and we asked a similar question, and I want to say we had maybe 10 people who, who, supported. who supported bioinformatics. Mm -hmm. So this is phenomenal. I think it's great. The field um, is growing. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder how many uh, institutions this uh, 41 represents. Like, is there multiple yeah, people so from one place? Yeah. Not that yeah. kind of part, but it's like one of the things I, I looked out when I was building the bioinformation program was trying to find out who else is out there. And yeah. it seemed extremely important to know what everybody's doing uh, to synchronize efforts. Definitely, maybe we could ask people to enter their institution in the chat pod, the institution name, and we can count how many different ones there are. Yes. If, if, if people want to. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I'm putting work on people. <laughs> You're asking an interesting question, JP. <laughs> well, and Which, I wonder, this is Elliot, I, I wonder whether there are librarians out there who, like me until a few years ago, are doing bioinformatics support but don't have an official job title that mentions bioinformatics. True. Mm -hmm. That's probably very true. Very true indeed. Okay. Well, I'm going to continue so that we can share more stories. And JP, I'm going to come to you now. And you said that the, finding the job at UMB had an element of unexpected opportunity. But what else has been successful for you at UMB? Yeah, so my little story will be about my brush with fame. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, in in bringing together uh, in bringing together uh, opportunities for the for the folks on campus, uh, one one of the things I found out and always felt was really important was understanding and working with NCBI tools. Uh, I didn't realize how easy it would be to get connected with the NCBI trainers, uh, and uh, through multiple opportunities of going to the NCBI for workshops to learn about specific databases and uh, eDirect. I think I've tried to learn eDirect a few times, and it definitely it's great to know people and ask you know direct questions. So uh, of, of the folks who train on that, like Peter Cooper, Wayne Matten, uh, Ben Busby. So these were some of the famous people that I connected with. 
and uh, they were really cool and 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 very generous with uh, their time. Uh, and one one opportunity that arose was a uh, biomedical data science uh, workshop that we ran. It was an all-day workshop, and the NCBI trainers actually came to UMB to the library, and we hosted this all-day event. Uh, we had a whole bunch of people, like 50 people, signed up. They showed up. It was it was a little hectic, but we were able to provide this great training opportunity. And I, and what really stood out for the researchers was they had that face-to-face, one-on-one chance to ask NCBI trainers questions that otherwise they'd have to submit through the, you know, the NCBI help desk. And that, those kind of opportunities, I think, make all the difference for, for, you know, the people that you work with on your campus. Definitely. And, of course, it does help that Baltimore is not that far from where we are in Bethesda, Maryland. Yeah, definitely. A little farther to go out to Elliott at University of California, Berkeley. Although a little we, more complicated. I was going to say we have held uh, the NCBI workshops out here as well. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's a great program, uh, and um, I, I hope it's able to continue. Yes, I agree. Great. Elliot, what is your most successful outreach or teaching experience? Um, so there are there are two that came to mind when um, uh, when you mentioned this, um, and every semester I offer an open workshop introducing bioinformatics resources um, from NCBI that are based on the examples uh, from the librarian's guide to NCBI course uh, that I took a few years ago. And this is the precursor to the current. EBEL online course that we're doing now. So Elliot was part of the in-person cohort, and now we teach the course only online. So just to clarify that and put that into context for everybody. But go on, Elliot. Yeah, thank you, Bonnie. Uh, so I, I continue to give those open workshops, but at one of the early ones, a faculty member from one of my departments attended and asked me to do a version of the workshop uh, specifically for his course, which is for graduate level genomics and computational biology students. Um, and so now each year when his course is offered, I provide this workshop for them, giving them an introduction to a cross section of the NCBI resources and databases. Um, so uh, that's been kind of a key way for me to make connections with uh, faculty and students uh, in my departments and who are working uh, uh, with these bioinformatics tools. Um, the second um, kind of successful outreach and teaching experience um, that I wanted to mention is one that I'm doing in collaboration with some other librarians here uh, on the Responsible Conduct of Research, uh, or RCR. Uh, which promotes research integrity and reproducibility. Um, and Berkeley is developing an RCR curriculum for incoming students in molecular and cell biology, chemical biology, and bioengineering. Um, its in-person RCR training is required for researchers supported by NIH funding. So together with the science data librarian and the research data management program manager here at Berkeley, uh, we reached out to the faculty member who is developing the curriculum, and uh, she asked us to do a data module for her class. And so we presented on the best practices for data recording, description, storage, and sharing. Uh, and it went so well that we've been invited back this fall for the new cohort of new graduate students. And she also would like us to do it for postdocs who are doing a five-year refresher course. So that's worked out really well. That sounds very interesting as well. And I hope that our attendees are perhaps jotting down some notes about different things that they can be doing back at their institutions. I will be recapping that at the end of our webinar also. But some of our attendees might wonder how to get started in the field. We had 31, I think, out of 57 people say they do support bioinformatics. 
That means approximately half do not. So let's talk about how to get started in the field, but it's time for another poll set of questions. So Kate? Okay, so um, again, I put up a poll for you to fill out, and this, uh, this one is asking if you have a science background, and then um, whether the thought of learning about bioinformatics is intimidating to you. And our definition of science background is? I would say have a bachelor's that included okay. science courses. But like <laughs> physical science, chemistry, oh. we're not restricting to just biology, no. are we? No. Okay. I wanted to make sure everyone knew it was an open definition of science. Mm. Okay, great. So how do we get started? JP, let's start with you. You ready for me? Yep. Okay, so how does one uh, get past uh, the intimidation factor? Um, mm -hmm. Don't try to learn everything all at once. Uh, get familiar with uh, the broader strokes and then focus on the finer details. Always remember, as far as molecular science goes, you're thinking about, and that's typically how my brain is tuned, especially if I think about bioinformatics, I'm thinking about uh, sequencing technology, sequences being derived from proteins. Proteins are sequences, RNA. RNA is a sequence, and DNA it comes as a sequence. Uh, there's different types of uh, experiments that you want to think about to interrogate these different molecules, and each of those experiments has its own type of data, and it's pretty simple. There's typically a tool to work with that type of experimental data, and sometimes there's like broad, you know, suites of tools that do a lot of things, but uh, there's also one tool for one specific job. Um, <clears throat> There's uh, molecular databases to store this information. NCBI provides access to these databases. There's a lot of information about all the molecules so you can make sense of what you're finding out. And uh, as far as getting past some of the intimidation, it's always great to make friends, uh, find people close to you who do this type of work, and don't, don't be shy to ask them questions. People are very friendly and open to helping you. Uh, I found more than rejecting you, and if you get rejected, move on to the next person who will help you, and don't, don't take it to heart. <laughs> that sounds good. Kumru, what about your advice to how someone should get started? Um, my initial advice is uh, don't be afraid of asking questions. Uh, don't forget part of the nature of librarianship is sharing information. Uh, I have met wonderful librarians, wonderful people, uh, and uh, they help me a lot on the way. <laughs> uh, and they will be happy to share with you. Uh, and sometimes it opens a new avenue to discover together. Uh, so. Uh, these are my <laughs> initial advices, uh, but technically um, learn the basic terminology in molecular biology, uh, as well as some coding like uh, Python coding that I learned, it helped me uh, a lot. And above all, uh, be curious and explore NCBI uh, website. It is amazing. Uh, and uh, these are my initial uh, advices. And for the people who might feel intimidated, what would you say to them? Okay, for intimidated, uh, when I took this bioinformatics for librarians class uh, last year, uh, I was so confident <laughs> that I have uh, uh, teaching experience more than 10 years, general biology teaching, molecular biology uh, masters, and so But I was even intimidated a little bit. <laughs> uh, but uh, it was a short time of period that you have to uh, 
watched the videos and uh, it, it was not uh, uh, very easy <laughs> to compile everything, but the terminologies are a little different to me. Uh, anyhow, I uh, converted that uh, to motivation for creating a, a C class, continuing education class for our local Philadelphia uh, MLA chapter. Uh, and uh, I know every medical librarian is able to include a uh, nucleotide blast uh, skill into the uh, service palette uh, for their researchers. So uh, I am starting with simple, uh, uh, small steps. Uh, hopefully we will uh, have some uh, intermediate level uh, classes, uh, but this will be a, a small step for our uh, region right now. That sounds good as well. And just to um, provide information for the audience who might not know, nucleotide blast is taking a DNA or RNA sequence and looking at the sequence that is put in by the researcher to then find if there are similar sequences in NCBI databases. And once you know that your DNA sequence is similar to what is already in the database, that can sometimes lead to identification of the organism from which it came, the DNA sequence from which it came, or from the gene that you were studying that you might not have realized uh, because of the way that the experimental protocol was um, put together. And then, Elliot, I'm going to turn to you now. And what would your advice be for someone to get started? Well, I think uh, both JP and Kumru have made uh, great points, particularly the willingness to ask questions. Um, uh, and I would also say um, uh, it's, uh, I found it helpful to develop a continuing education strategy and to try to build it into your regular responsibilities, um, partly because the field is changing constantly. There are new technologies, tools, research methods, um, and resources that are constantly being developed. Um, even established research methods can change over time. Um, and it's important to try to keep abreast of these changes and how researchers' needs are evolving. Um, in terms of intimidation, I'd say uh, if I can do it, you can do it. I mean, I <laughs> do not have a biology degree, um, and now I'm, you know, teaching bioinformatics workshops. So, um, you know, if it's possible for me, it's possible for, for you as well. Um, I do recommend uh, trying to get, um, uh, as Kumru mentioned, a, a good grasp of the underlying concepts and terminology and vocabulary that's, um, that's used in molecular biology um, relating to gene expression and function. Um, and then you'll have a better understanding when you turn to the tools and resources of uh, the kinds of um, questions that they can answer. Okay. That sounds great as well. Thank you again, all three of you, for those items of advice and encouragement. Kate, what are the results from the poll questions? Well, for this poll we asked um, two questions. First, do you have a science background? Sorry, I'm trying to share the results. Oh, they are. Okay, they're, they should be up in the lower on the lower right of your screen, I believe. Um, so we have uh, 28 of the 55 have a science background, and 27 do not. So you know we're about half and half. So that's very interesting. Um, the second question: Does the thought of learning about bioinformatics intimidate you? Um, well, we've got 23 folks out there who feel a little intimidated. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully, the thoughts that um, our guests just shared will um, will help assuage your fears a little bit. Okay, great. And it will be interesting to hear from our audience. You can type in the chat pod whether or not we are succeeding with this webinar on perhaps taking away the intimidation feeling or 
Unfortunately, we might be increasing it, but we definitely want to underscore the fact of ask people. You've, we've identified some people on the panel as well, and there are other people to be in touch with when you have questions at your institution. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be approaching the end of the webinar soon, and I'm going to ask the panelists about the future of bioinformatics and bioinformatics librarianship. But we have one more poll question, set of poll questions for the audience. So Kate, open this one now. Dan, we have two questions for you. And we'd like to add your comments or other um, responses into the chat. So um, the first question is, um, do you plan to do work related to, and then we've given you a bunch of different options, um, and if you have some other kind of work that you plan to do related to bioinformatics, um, please add those in chat. And then the second question is about your, your continuing education strategy, as we were just talking about, and do you plan to learn more about, and then some options, and again, um, if you could add other ideas you have into chat. I think that would be helpful for everyone. Okay. So we're going to give you the time to go ahead and work on those two questions as we hear from the panel about their thoughts of the future of bioinformatics. So JP, let's start with you. Okay. My favorite talk, the future. <laughs> let's remember that the future is not written, so that gives us a lot of opportunity. Uh, to integrate ourselves into whatever is coming down the line. Um, <clears throat> I really think uh, the future is openly accessible tools uh, that allow you to work on the data uh, that's being produced, wherever the data is being held, typically like a repository or something like that. Uh, and whatever system you're working in will allow for reproducibility. Uh, we relate, like, using, you know, programming languages like R and Python uh, to reproducibility because essentially as you write code, it's making it reproducible. So, um, and finally, I think something uh, that is going to be happening is the integration of multiple uh, types of molecular data in, in the understanding of uh, biological systems. And okay. I can concentrate on integration of data if you want. Why don't you go ahead and talk a little bit about integration of data? We have a little uh, bit of time. Sure, sure. So if you think about a cell, uh, cell we have uh, proteins. Uh, they all have activities uh, that are going on, and they're spatial, uh, like where in the cell something is happening, and temporal the timing at which something is happening in the cell. So spatial, temporal uh, information uh, overlaid with the molecular information. So where in the cell is the protein located? What is the, the difference between a healthy and a disease state in that cell? And uh, also the context of the other molecules involved in the system and how they're fluctuating at any space and time. So more, more so, we're able to very discreetly identify these, uh, these features of uh, systems, specifically biological systems. And uh, a lot of tools are allowing us to integrate these multiple types of data so we can get a wider glimpse of what's going on in real time uh, with uh, disease states because I think the um, majority uh, of the research that we do is to understand disease so we can cure disease and make people healthy. Right. And I often t try to explain to people who are not familiar with the research method how we can't change a lot of different variables all at the same time. We have to go one by one. So mm -hmm. in a system that you described, it's somewhat time-consuming to do each of the experiments by changing one protein to see how it interacts with the other proteins in the cell. And mm -hmm. many people don't quite realize that. Um, Kumar, I'm going to go to you to see what you think is the future of bioinformatics. And why don't you share that 
thought with us. Sure. Uh, JP pointed out something interesting, integration data. Um, so it's growing, integration is growing, uh, and uh, researchers uh, uh, create some uh, softwares uh, or develop some softwares for uh, like Adobe Manner, and uh, when they um, when the researchers opted to uh, share them, uh, will be hosted by personal websites and lab websites. Uh, so such websites and consequently the resources uh, they provided were likely to be lost over time. So I think it is maybe because of my uh, regulatory background. Uh, I think in the future the regulatory aspects will evolve with bioinformatics. Right now it is very much uh, open sources. Um, and uh, the other thing uh, in librarian uh, perspective, uh, I see bioinformatics librarians mostly collaborating with the uh, medical librarians. Uh, my experiences with uh, the chemistry department uh, is a little um, interesting to me because they are working for pharmaceutical uh, discoveries and they are using bioinformatics. Also, environmental sciences uh, researchers uh, are using bioinformatics, uh, open access tools. Uh, I think in the near future, the presence and visibility of uh, bioinformatics librarians will increase uh, by being able to uh, add some simple coding skills. Okay. And Elliot, what do you want to share about the future of bioinformatics? Well, I think both JP and Kumru have made some great points. Um, I think one of the things that is going to, it's, it's happening now, but I think it's only going to increase, is the uh, effort to try to derive insights from the analysis of large-scale data. Yeah. And um, that means the increasing application, I think, of uh, text and data mining techniques to the biomedical literature. Mm -hmm. um, the increased use of machine learning algorithms for the analysis and interpretation of genomic data. Um, and I think these kinds of techniques um, have some great promise. Clearly, we are just at the beginning of things like translational bioinformatics, um, gene therapies, uh, personalized uh, and precision medicine. Um, and I would also think that um, kind of new areas will be opening up. For example, um, I think there's going to be uh, uh, an increasing amount of research into the microbiome and its effects on human health. Okay. And where do you – that interview question that people ask that um, – interviewees dread, and that is, where do you see yourself in five years? And what I mean by this is, where do you see the role of the bioinformatics librarian, perhaps, in five years? What tools or skills do they need to pick up? So that's, you know, a great question. I think, um, as ever, uh, in bioinformatics librarianship especially, probably, um, you need to be flexible and just be willing to continue to learn and grow. But that's, you know, part of the fun aspect of librarianship. Um, I think we will all need to understand more about uh, large-scale data analysis um, and how it's applied to various kinds of omics data and the kinds of support that researchers and Kumru and JP both made excellent points about um, learning a little bit about coding. Uh, Python and R uh, are very commonly used languages, and it's good to uh, learn a bit, little bit about how those are applied. Um, and I think uh, librarians will also uh, have a significant role in uh, coordinating services for researchers throughout their research workflows. So from licensing some of the tools they use to 
organizing workshops and trainings, um, offering uh, data support, data management <coughs> uh, training, um, and support for publication kind of at the end of the research process. Okay. JP, okay. is there anything you want to add about? I'm sorry, I'm talking about TikTok because I got so excited by Elliot's uh, responses. And I wanted to also say that he was doing an amazing job with what he was adding to our conversation. And uh, just to echo what he said, I really think a big part of what libraries can do is providing access to those big data sets, especially the open data sets, molecular data sets. Uh, SRA has like, you know, Mount Everest of data. And uh, being able to access that data and do something meaningful for like uh, reproduction purposes uh, is not always, you know, straightforward. And since we have a direct connection with NCBI as a health science library and NLM, uh, it makes sense that we become like an outpost in the wild uh, to bring all that uh, essential information on how to work with that open data. And, and, you know, liaise with our campuses to uh, submit data and retrieve data. Okay, great. Thank you again, the three of you, for sharing your thoughts about the future. So Kate is going to share information about the last poll question about what work you plan to do or what you plan to learn about. Kate? Okay, so you should be able to see on your screen right now the responses to those two questions. Um, and of course, the, the chat has been busy with uh, text responses to add to, to the ideas that we uh, came up with. Um, so it looks like um, lots of folks, not surprisingly, are getting involved in data management, uh, publication support, uh, data analysis, um, and open access, and you can see some of the other responses in there. And uh, what we're planning on learning more about, uh, definitely more about data management, not surprisingly, a uh, good number uh, selected coding, like R and Python, and uh, also a very good number selected metadata standards. And um, I'm hoping that over the next couple of years, NLM will be able to offer more training in that area. Um, so that's that's good to know. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Kate. So today, just to recap some of the things that we heard about, one is always have your elevator speech ready. You never know who you might meet in an elevator and where it can lead. The retirement of a colleague can lead to new opportunities. Consider to have public author events for those people who have written books or articles. Take advantage of the opportunities, create your own bioinformatics curriculum, host data science workshops, NCBI workshops in particular perhaps. Think about going through the research conduct and re reproducibility aspects of bioinformatics. And of course, learn the molecular biology vocabulary. So I thank our panelists again for their time and their willingness to reflect on bioinformatics librarianship. Once again, we were joined today by J.P. Kernia from the University of Maryland at Baltimore, Kumru Castro from Drexel University, and Elliot Smith from the University of California in Berkeley. Kate has one more poll question for the audience and then she'll provide information of great interest and close us out. So, Kate? Okay, so you should see on your screen one last poll, and this is very self-serving of us. We are asking you about what NLM resources that you usually have questions about. Um, so go ahead and fill that out and click Submit when you're done. And um, I... Oh, um, and Nancy, these are questions that you get from your patrons. Okay, so while you're filling that out, I also wanted to say thank you all for sharing your fascinating stories, um, really interesting 
stories from our panelists today and uh, lots of interesting comments and questions from others in the chat panel, so please make sure you take a look at those. Also, a lot of resource sharing going on in chat, um, so if you get a chance. And when uh, we post the uh, recording, um, I'll try to collect those uh, resource links uh, so I can put those up as well on the webinar page on the network site where you registered for this webinar. So we hope that you are all inspired and thinking about ways that you can support science at your institutions. Uh, if you haven't already, uh, consider signing up for our course, uh, Bioinformatics and Biology Essentials for Librarians. We offer that every spring and fall. Uh, registration for the spring course will be announced in the NLM Technical Bulletin. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel. Select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.